Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, have you ever heard of a guy named Mark Dever? Many of you have, but maybe many of you have not. We like to ask the question around here, so what? What's it matter? Well, he's planting churches all across America, over 4,000 of them with his group called Nine Marks. Tonight, you'll understand the worldview of Mark Dever, who's part of the Gospel Coalition and Together for the Gospel. And we believe he's helping to promote Marxianity. My guest live in studio, Tom Littleton. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. WVW-TV presents the Worldview Weekend Hour with Brandon House. Whether the topic is law, science, government, economics, history, family, social issues, education, or theology, Brennan brings the issues of today into clear focus through the lens of a biblical worldview. And now, here is your host, Brennan House. Welcome to the broadcast. Glad you're with us. I'm Brandon House. It's the Worldview Weekend Hour, and we are very excited to have with us live in studio someone who's been a friend for a while now via phone and Skype. We've interviewed him for television by Skype, had him on the radio many, many times, but it's our first time to have him with us in studio, and we're really happy to have him drive over from Birmingham, Alabama. His name is Tom Littleton. He's written many articles, and in fact, his articles have gone viral. Many of you a year or two ago didn't even know who Tom Littleton was. Now you look forward to each and every article writing about the deep state, the evangelical deep state that is. Tom, welcome into our studios. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Brandon. Good to be with you. Well, we've sure enjoyed getting to know you. You and I have researched a lot of the same things independently for years without knowing each other. And in fact, in my uh, new book, Marxianity, I write this about you. I said, my friend Tom Littleton has been a real encouragement to me a guest many times on my radio program, he always shares fascinating research with my listeners. Before becoming good friends in early 2018, Tom and I had independently come to some of the same conclusions about trends, people, groups, worldviews we were tracking. Later in 2018, Tom wrote an article that truly showed how far we have come. To his conclusions, I add my own assessment that we are now living in a post-communist America that is being furthered by a post-communist evangelicalism. Why? Because people have come to tolerate the cultural Marxism and socialism we see in America today. In fact, the communists of the 1930s and 40s may have hoped for, but would never have dreamed possible to achieve this level of acceptance. They never dreamed this would happen. They never dreamed it would be accepted at this level is really what I'm saying here. So that's why we're in a post-modern America, a postmodern evangelicalism. The communists of the 1930s and 40s never dreamed they could get evangelicals to promote what they're promoting today. Neither would they have imagined the extent to which evangelicalism has embraced the merger of Marxism and Christianity. Early communists readily believed they could infiltrate liberal mainline churches, but they would have never conceived that the so-called conservative right of evangelicalism would produce so many useful idiots willing to promote their ideology through social justice, white privilege, human flourishing, common good, shared responsibility, sustainable development, and countless other masking terms for communist ideology. We should all be equally shocked. Did you ever think you would come to see the day when, quote, pastor, in quote, Mark Dever of the Gospel Coalition, together for the gospel and nine marks, and an annual speaker for well-known Bible conferences, would endorse a cultural Marxist agenda that seeks to mainstream the radical LGBTQ agenda into mainstream evangelicalism. That is from my new book, Marxianity. And Tom, uh, that's what we're going to talk about now. Because this guy, Mark Dever, is really acting, whether he knows it or not, intends to or not, in many regards, as a change agent. Is he not? Yes, absolutely. It's been a busy year, Brandon. I mean, we've, we've watched so much unfold this year. I think we've, we've, we've crossed the line on a lot of things. Uh, of course, MOK 50 conference, which was a, a Gospel Coalition and uh, ERLC co-sponsored event, really got a lot of people's attention. We began to see the narrative, uh, you know, with more of the cards on the table. So clearly uh, we've, we've seen just this year, I think, a turning point where a lot of this uh, political agenda of uh, these mainstream evangelicals 
uh, particularly in the reformed camp, the neo-reformed camp. Their political agenda is on the table and uh, we're seeing that uh, especially and, and I think most vulnerably exposed in their pro-LGBT policy. Uh, Dever is a Southern Baptist. Uh, I, I too am a Southern Baptist. Uh, I never thought I would live to see the day that we would see a, a inclusion audit uh, being implemented in Southern Baptist churches in America, but that happened just a month ago in November. So uh, Dever was the one who was responsible for bringing that into three of his nine Marks uh, churches here in the, in the states that included his own Capitol Hill Baptist, another Del Rey Baptist, and then an independent church uh, also affiliated with nine Marks uh, in uh, Massachusetts. Wow. Well, let me quote, if I can, again, from my book, Marxianity, because I talk about you on page 302 again. I said, here's how Tom Littleton sees this feeding the Marxist agenda. Quote, in America, the evangelical leadership of Albert Moeller, Russell Moore, Tim Keller, the Gospel Coalition, and the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention have lately presumed to, ta ta to take on the task of remolding God's design for the family. They now attack the, quote, idolatry of family, end quote, and assert we must replace it with an inclusive and expanding village church family. In America, the end of innocence may be at hand, bringing God's judgment with it. Let us look soberly at where we have arrived in the parade of exhausting and relentless forced uh, conversations and endless conversing led by the court jesters we have allowed in leadership. Tell us about what you mean by that wonderful paragraph. <laughs> well, sad to say that we're seeing uh, at, uh, you know, at this stage in the game, we're seeing uh, the talking points basically uh, nuanced and the conversation led by a very small circle of people, primarily those within the Gospel Coalition uh, who've also influenced our seminaries, uh, the Presbyterian Church of America and the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, all being heavily influenced by these same men like Mark Dever. Uh, they're also begetting after their own kind, which uh, uh, if you think they're gospel driven, you wouldn't have a problem with that. But when you begin to see the cultural Marxism and the leftist political agenda that they're pushing, uh, this pro-gay policy, then you realize the fact that Nine Marx has over 4,000 affiliated churches uh, some SBC and some not. Uh, when we begin to see the tens of thousands of pastors who are heavily influenced by the Gospel Coalition and the uh, rabid uh, popularity of uh, guys like Russell Moore and uh, the, the theological giant here, uh, Al Mohler, we see that they're essentially reshaping the church uh, right before our very eyes. They're reshaping its theology to what is not at all a classic uh, reformed theology. It's a neo-Marxist, neo-Calvinist uh, ideology and uh, it's politically driven, it's uh, emergent. And when we see this LGBT agenda, I I've kept saying maybe for about seven years now that this is where they're most vulnerable, that we're seeing them openly bringing about uh, the, the church move toward accepting and affirming homosexuality. And in one the of the comments you made there is that there, this is the emergent church, in, uh, shameless plug again, in the book Marxianity, I have a whole, cha a whole chapter entitled, The Gospel Coalition is the Emergent Church. Yes. And many of the guys that were opposed to the emergent church, which was promoting um, back in the, uh, turn of the turn of the century, if you will, the early 2000s, late, about the mid 1990s, it started gaining speed. And then it really came into focus around 2003, 2004, 2005 in that area, it got on the radar of you know people like us mm -hmm. and others, but they'd been meeting quietly behind the scenes since the mid 90s and late 90s. But the emergent church is heavily into social justice, mysticism, uh, allegorizing scripture, people like Rob Bell, uh, Shane Claiborne, uh, Brian McLaren, uh, they're liberal socially, liberal economically, liberal uh, theology. And many of the guys that claim to have been opposed to the emergent church are now the very guys promoting it through the Gospel Coalition. The Gospel Coalition is the emergent church repackaged, but being brought into uh, a, a so-called neo-Calvinist uh, theology. So these are neo-Calvinists, new are neo-Calvinists, Al Mohler, Mark Dever, uh, Tibetti, uh, Tim Keller, Lingen Duncan, correct? 
Correct. And it should have been a clue to us that Mark uh, Driscoll found a home uh, among these guys and also uh, that one of their most popular bloggers uh, in the Gospel Coalition was uh, Talian Chavidjan. These guys were openly uh, antinomian. Uh, in Explain the, some of these terms. Well, uh, they were basically Corinthian Christians, guys who said you could do whatever you want to in the flesh uh, and, uh, and, and really come brought antinomian, in. Antinomian meaning they were against the law. Right. They were, pl- and, they were basically saying that Christians aren't held to the Ten Commandments today or the laws of God. It's it's more about uh, really seeking your pleasure in God. Christian right. hedonism is promoted by John Piper, John Piper, who also denies that you cannot define, uh, you know, sin by covenant keeping or covenant breaking or commandment keeping or commandment breaking mm-hmm. that the Ten Commandments, even though nine, nine out of ten are repeated in the New <laughs> Testament, he says they're not for today. This is not how you define sin. We have that on uh, video. I mean, it, this is what yeah. they believe. So this is what you mean when you say antinomianism, mm-hmm. which then really leads to basically a um, uh, no, no standards, right? Yeah. If it feels good, do it. Uh, sex for the body, the body for sex. That's what the uh, uh, the Corinthians were saying. And see, this stuff is nothing new. It's really just recycling the same old lies that have uh, ensnared the first century church. Only today we can market this stuff far more effectively with social media and with blogs and uh, with the printing press. You know, everything's changed now that we can just put out so much of this information out on the internet into our books and conferences. And that's how they've really spread the influence of the Gospel Coalition there and, of course, in our seminaries. That's Mm -hmm. where it's uh, trickling down most quickly into our churches through the pulpits and into the pews as these guys' books and their talking points are being echoed from our very pulpits. And what's very concerning is there's no denominational distinctives anymore. Have you noticed that? Right, right. Because of uh, its work across the uh, reformed camp, uh, the Gospel Coalition, and even the RLC, which is a Southern Baptist entity, they've carried uh, this uh, influence well beyond denominations. The church planting, for instance, with Nine Marks, with uh, Mark Driscoll, uh, they have been able to plant all sorts of churches, not just within their denomination. Same is true with Tim Keller, who has uh, planted, uh, I think, somewhere around 500 churches, confirmed by his Redeemer City to City to me in an email. Only a third of those churches are Presbyterian. Church of America, which is his denomination. So two-thirds of his churches are outside his own denomination. Mm-hmm. So there's no uh, accountability. There's no, um, there's no theological framework within uh, which they must operate. And, and the uh, reason that we bring that up is because you have people who have been, let's say, uh, fundamentalist Baptist, very Bible-based, conservative, evangelical pastors, right? And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're promoting the neo-Calvinists uh, Tim Keller, Mark Dever, Al Moeller, and I'll get uh, someone, you know, emailing or posting on social media who is housed to be calling out men like Mark Dever or Al Moeller. And you look at who they are, and they cons- come from a conservative Baptist background, non-Calvinistic, conservative Baptist background. And you're like, why are you defending these guys? This is not even from your camp. Right. But see, this is, again, there's no, de- there's no denominational distinctives. All the, all the denominations are really merging. And all of a sudden you think, well, I go to an independent Baptist church. I go to an independent Bible church. I go to a non-reformed, non-charismatic, excuse me, non-reformed, non-Calvinist church. But yet your pastors are being influenced by guys that are ca- neo-Calvinist. Neo meaning new, a new kind of Calvinist who are promoting liberation theology socialism mixed with Christianity, or replacement theology, the church has replaced Israel, or they're promoting things like um, dominion theology. We have to take dominion and Christianize the world and set up God's kingdom. Well, the denomination you come from doesn't teach any of that. It never has historically. But all of a sudden, your pastors are being influenced by the guys who are the neo-Calvinists who do teach that, and that, that's run right into your denomination. So there's no denominational distinctives anymore. So the point being made is you may be saying, uh, House and Littleton, hey, newsflash, I don't go to a neo-Calvinist church. Uh, I go to a church that has a very distinct doctrinal statement with pastors who come from a her- history and heritage that doesn't embrace those things. Well, they do on paper. On paper, your church has a distinct doctrinal statement on paper. But in practice, your pastors from your denomination that has historically not embraced these things, it, they are being influenced by the neo-Calvinist Al Mohler, Mark Dever, Lincoln Duncan, Tim Keller, and others, correct? Correct. That's absolutely correct. And it is proven by the fact that these churches are being planted by guys like Mark Dever or Tim Keller that are not even from the Reformed camp. 
that they're from. So they're planting churches that are, aren't even a part of their denomination or association, which proves our point, correct? Right, and the great irony with Tim Keller is that until just recently when he left his pulpit at Redeemer uh, Church in New York, and went full time with his uh, planting arm, his global planting arm, which is Redeemer City to City. Uh, up until just recently, uh, Willow Creek Association was actually providing all of the resources and the training for his churches, including the PCA church. So if you were giving money to plant PCA churches to Tim Keller, you may be shocked to find that uh, Willow Creek, the uh, crossless, uh, seeker-friendly uh, church growth model uh, of um, Bill Hybels, who's just recently been removed from his pulpit was actually um, uh, uh, resourcing these church plants. So uh, it, it comes back to really a, an, an awakening for us, a reality, the realization that doctrine may provide for them some cover, but doctrine and theology actually means very little to these men. Well, the old ecumenical slogan was doctrine divides and the spirit unites. And that is why you had denominationals, denominational distinctives because you had doctrinal beliefs, while they would agree on maybe on the, what the essential gospel message is, there were some doctrinal distinctives that made up each individual denomination, correct? Correct. Now what you're saying is those doctrinal distinctives are gone, thus the denominational distinctives are gone, and now all of a sudden you think you go to this independent Baptist church or independent Bible church, or you think you go to an Assembly of God church, and you're thinking, well, we're not gonna be influenced by the neo-Calvinists, um, sorry, you are, because again, the doctrinal distinctives are gone, and now this is all coming in with very well-known guys like, again, Tim Keller, Lincoln Duncan, Mark Dever, Al Mohler, and others. And so, again, what we're talking about is really a total transformation of mainstream evangelicalism and a total transformation of the mission and purpose of the church, but it's the things that we thought these guys were opposed to we come to find out that's all just a shell game. They're promoting the same liberalism that Bob Buford, Peter Drucker, Rick Warren were promoting that we were warning about years ago. We thought these guys were opposed to that too. Come to find out they've just packaged their theology and used that as a cloak to deceive people into thinking they're very conservative, maybe even fundamental uh, conservative evangelicals. That's all a ruse to cover the fact that they're really social justice warriors, change agents, correct? Right. Right, and, and actually the, when people trust them to be operating within a, a theological framework, when they are espousing that, when you consider yourself uh, uh, with, with maybe your child is in uh, um, seminary uh, if, uh, or your pastor, you think, well, they're getting a very solid theological training here. That's not, not necessarily true. It's not true. As a matter of fact, it's more likely not the case because they're getting so much of this other um, you know, church growth strategy taught, the social justice. And that's one of the things we revealed in the evangelical deep state is that uh, the social justice driven um, ideology is actually in the curriculum and was firmly in 13 of our conservative seminaries by 2013. Now it's in over 23 three of those seminaries, plus the undergrad and Christian colleges and universities. And these were the seminaries that everyone thought were the conservative mm -hmm. evangelical ones holding the line that you could trust, and yet it turns out the very social justice agenda was in the curriculum of what we thought were the really conservative evangelical seminaries. Right. And, and if people look back, 2013 is when everything really began to change. Uh, I, I think probably the, uh, the, the biggest marker along the road for us would have been over the LGBT issue, and that's one reason that I've continued to just hound this issue with where we are with the church, because we're actually having a conversation that we never really needed to have. It's a highly nuanced conversation, and we watch uh, the Gospel Coalition, Tim Keller, they brought these guys from the Church of England in uh, uh, with a ministry called Living Out. Uh, they're the guys who authored this um, uh, church audit and have uh, implemented this course for those who will sign on to it to uh, ask you how biblically inclusive is your church. And we covered this on the radio that there are 10 points uh, where they want to basically police your uh, pulpit, they want to police private conversations, even uh, attitudes, uh, and they want to make sure that no one talks about homosexuality without mentioning other sins. Uh, and then they want to uh, have um, uh, essentially quotas because they're wanting to make sure that you're hiring LGBT, that you're including LGBT. And so your church then becomes 
uh, a platform for the gay agenda to be brought straight into. And ironically, one of the, when you mentioned uh, from quoting from the book about them redefining family, uh, probably called it also uh, idolatry of family. Yeah, the, the idolatry of family. Uh, this actually comes from Drew uh, uh, the, uh, Theological School, and back in the early 90s, and uh, a woman, Miss Fishburn, who had this idea that we should undermine um, the uh, the classic idea of family, and this is vintage uh, cultural Marxist approach. And so they began to push the idea that family is an idol. Um, uh, the Ethics and Religious Liberties leader, which is um, Russell Moore part of the Gospel Coalition as well. He just recently had a conference uh, called the Storm Toss Family, and they actually had these talking points that uh, the, the family is an idol and that we need to bring these, uh, you know, uh, these fresh views in to rethink and redefine, reimagine family as the church. Well, then that church is this very inclusive church. So uh, Sam Alberry, one of the guys who wrote this, um, uh, biblically inclusive uh, church audit for LGBT inclusion actually asserted that we should uh, include uh, sharing our resources, our homes, our, our holiday meals, and even our children to people who are of uh, different backgrounds. So this is shocking, even your children. I, I want, let me quote from you again, in, again, from the book Marxianity, I'm quoting an article by Tom. He says, quote, Freshly off their promotion of the Radical Revoice Conference, this was a conference held in July of this uh, last year, 2018, uh, in St. Louis. And by the way, it was put on and founded by a guy named Nate Collins, who got his degree, his PhD, and wrote his book um, while at uh, Al Mulder Seminary. And he dis the Amazon description of his book, his book is called in All, All, but Invisible. All But Invisible. And the Amazon description of the book, as we've discussed before, states that he is a, 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 gay, a gay man living in a mixed orientation marriage, correct? correct? Correct, Which means he's married and he has children, but he calls himself a gay man. Yes. And so that was Revoice, was the conference they held, uh, and we covered it here. In fact, we broke it on our program with mm -hmm. you, and then it went all over the country. It was one of the biggest stories of the summer. And again, would you have ever thought that uh, uh, people like, you know, Mark Dever, of the Gospel Coalition, Together for the Gospel, Nine Marks, who also speaks with, you know, at, at well-known Bible conferences. This is another thing. They're, these guys are getting a lot of theological cover from well-known Bible teachers, which is what is causing people to think they're trustworthy, correct? Right. And, and they're using an emotional narrative, an emotional appeal. Uh, nobody wants to be branded a homophobe or to say your church is homophobic, that people are not welcome. There's a, a core fallacy in their approach, uh, which ironically, when you look at this church audit and you see these 10 um, statements that you mark as true or false or you're not sure, they actually ask you to affirm something in the Evangelical Alliance uh, uh, statement on LGBT. Now, let's before. explain what that is. What is the Evangelical Alliance statement on LGBT and what is it have to do with this 10-point survey. What? Okay. They're working uh, as partners with Living Out, which is the Albury London-based organization. London-based organization, which Tim Keller has been speaking at their conference. They promoted Revoice. Uh, they still include Revoice speakers. Which and again, Revoice was, was all about mainstreaming the LGBT people into your evangelical, quote, evangelical churches. Yeah, in their own words, they were uh, promoting LGBT plus thriving in historic Christian tradition. And the inclusive and, survey that we're about to read from will tell us what that means. Right. Okay. So uh, Evangelical Alliance, a larger umbrella organization that works out of the uh, EU, or rather in the EU and uh, the U United Kingdom, uh, they had 10 points as well that they wanted you to affirm before you agreed to sign on to the training and to bring this audit into your church. And number 10, it says, we encourage evangelical congregations to welcome and accept sexually active lesbians and gay men. However, they should do so in the expectation that they, like all of us who are living outside God's purpose, will come in due course to see the need to be transformed and live in accordance with biblical uh, revelation and orthodox church teaching. Now the problem with this is we're right back uh, to uh, initially with uh, the out, uh, you know, the living out narrative was, well, these are celibate uh, uh, same-sex attracted Christians. Now we're saying we want to let sexually active 
uh, uh, people who claim to be Christian into the church. And so, who predicted who predicted that that would go from being celibate LGBT to sexually active LGBT? Who predicted it was going to go that way? Well, I think we all were we trying did. to. We did. And, and on radio, TV, we told you. You and I told yeah. our audience, this is just getting the camel's nose under the tent. Yeah. It's they're saying now, um, you know, abstinence. Uh, they're not practicing homosexuals. They're same-sex attracted, but they're not practicing. Now they're saying you got to accept people who are practicing LGBT. Any, and, of course, the question is, would any church knowingly, any true evangelical Bible-believing church, knowingly embrace someone who is sexually active outside of marriage into church membership or leadership? Well, not if you're following the biblical standard, right? Yeah, but they're not qualifying whether they're married or not. They're right. Just saying they can be active, and really, what we see is we suddenly have two standards uh, for sexuality. Heterosexuals would actually be held to within a conservative church that was going to go this uh, this pathway uh, would would be held to a different standard. And because a person is LGBT, of course, uh, they wouldn't be held to that standard at all. They could be sexually active outside of marriage, or they could come as a couple. And the problem is, th this is totally total ignorance of Scripture. It's total ignorance of the church. It's trying to use the body of Christ as an evangelistic tool. And we're not supposed to make them... Is it trying to do that, or is it trying to just be change agents to destroy the well, church? Well, at best, it's trying to use make the church attractive and welcoming and appealing. And I think that's the marketing. Is it that, or is it also trying to make sure that when the laws come down on Christians, they already have a track record of being pro-LGBT, so they can also be sure to be entering into contracts with state, local, and federal governments for lots of money? Yeah, we're proving our uh, uh, affirming and uh, that... Because that if once you approve right. you're politically correct, th then you don't have to worry about the government coming after you. Right. And then once you prove you're politically correct, all the uh, state, local, and federal government contracts they can receive as social justice service centers, they can now receive millions and millions of dollars. So they're laying down a narrative that makes them qualified for all the... Uh, goodies that go for the with the government and no none of the persecution right right and the irony is I said uh, in the beginning this is now already in a couple of Southern Baptist churches here thanks to Mark Dever it's been implemented here in November 2018 you know mark your calendars people that's when the SBC moved into apostasy regarding uh, homosexuality if this had happened five years ago uh, Dever's church would have been kicked out of the Southern Baptist Convention well, and here's what you write. You say, freshly off their promotion of the Radical Revoice Conference and hosting of Tim Keller and his wife, Kathy, for a gay Christianity extravaganza in London, Living Out stepped into the global spotlight to promote a church audit for LGBTQ plus inclusion and its conference legacy. They declared, quote, at our, at our Identity in Christ conference with Tim and Kathy Keller in June 2018, we launched our Living Out Church Audit, a tool to help church leadership teams answer this key question. How biblically inclusive is your church? Unsurprisingly, our focus is on those who might identify, unsurprisingly, our focus is on how those in, uh, might identify as LGBTQ+, same-sex attracted. Jesus included all in a counter-cultural way, and we hope this audit will help our churches follow his lead, end quote. Now, we're going to get into what the audit is, but Mark Dever shockingly to some, actually sponsored this UK group's Living Out Audit conference in the US just in November or October, it was October? In November. November, so November 2018. November. Mm -hmm. November 2018, Mark Dever, the Gospel Coalition, Together for the Gospel, nine marks, it's planned over 4,000 churches. Uh, his church sponsored the Living Out conference with this inclusion survey we're about to, to read from, correct? Yes, and so far I haven't seen any videos surface from that, but I will say this. Uh, his, uh, one of his uh, protégés, uh, Garrett Kell, who is the pastor of Del Rey Baptist, which is also a Nine Marks church in Virginia, was uh, that both Capitol Hill and Del Rey were listed on, uh, initially on the Living Out site as the host and, and working together for this. Both are Nine Marks churches. But as soon as we really went forward and, and exposed some mm -hmm. of this stuff, so I think several other outlets picked it up as well. Devers Church was taken off. We have the screenshots though. Yeah. 
And, and so it does tell you that it, it does some good if we're getting these guys to, you know, trying to slip back under the covers with this stuff. They know they're doing wrong. They know they're doing something that is not in keeping with their reputation. They know that people are trusting them to be something that clearly they are not. You know what's really interesting is that Mark Dever runs with a lot of these uh, neo-Calvinists and uh, extreme Calvinists. Uh, and again, we don't have an issue with the classic Reformed people, you know, Charles Ryrie, um, you know, my friend Tommy Ice is, is traditional reformed, uh, but he's, he's not into um, the extremism of it. He, in fact, is open about his defense of the gospel in regards to free grace. Charles Ryrie was the same thing. So we're not picking on reformed people, okay? What we're talking about are the neo-Calvinists, the new Calvinists. They're into social justice, liberation theology, mixing Marxism with Christianity, socialism with Christianity, uh, dominion theology. We've got to conquer and take dominion. Their eschatology drives this. Their end-time belief drives this. These are these new Calvinists or hyper-Calvinists. And frankly, a lot of the, a lot of the guys that claim they weren't neo-Calvinist uh, and, and uh, claim that they were just you know, traditional Calvinists, they're not anymore. I mean, they've really moved in. I mean, if you're hanging out with Tim Keller, Lincoln Duncan, uh, Al Mohler, you can't claim to be a mainstream conservative Calvinist anymore. You have, you have just moved into the camp of, with the neo-Calvinists, whether you want to admit it or not, when you start sharing the platform with them, bringing them to your conferences to speak, you're speaking with them, confusing the living daylights out of people. So we're not going after reform people. This isn't a Arminians versus Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminian. I'm a Biblicist. Uh, you're not a Calvinist either, and you're also yeah. not an Arminian. Correct. So we're just coming from the biblical perspective. What we're trying to show you is that you may not know who these people are, but your pastors largely do. And again, we're coming back to repeat. Why are we covering this? Because most of you don't know who these people are. Our regulars do. But this is why your church that you thought was conservative is now in transition. Right. Traditional, transitional, completely transformed. And many of you don't know why. Well, it's the books they're reading the conferences are going to, and the people they're watching online and on YouTube. Now, what's really interesting is Mark Dever, who is you know, thought by so many to be so sound theologically, and, and some pastors have posted publicly, who is how think he is to call these men out? I mean, after all, these guys are giants in the faith, I guess, they, to them. Well, they put their pants on one leg at a time like the rest of us, and here are the facts, and they can't refute it, and we've got the screenshots, and we've got, it all, we've got everything we need to show there's a problem. But what's interesting is nobody that we know of in their camp is calling out Mark Dever. Not one person that we know of in their camp is calling out Mark Dever publicly. And yet some of the people in his camp were all over us, trashing us <coughs> throughout all of 2000, most of 2017 and all of 2018, because we dared to point out an interfaith dialogue with a Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, jihadi preaching imam. People from Mark Dever's camp and all those extreme Calvinists they were all over us for exposing that with their buddy, who's an extreme Calvinist, James White. But Mark Dever can go and promote the living out LGBTQ uh, trash and an inclusive agenda, which includes sharing your children with same-sex attracted people, apparently, and nobody from his camp says a word. Does that not tell you the, the transformation? You cannot speak about interfaith dialogue in a church with a Jew-hating, Holocaust-denying, Hitler-defending, jihadi imam with one of the extreme Calvinists. If you do that, you get trashed. But one of the extreme Calvinists and neo-Calvinists can push the whole LGBTQ agenda and they say nothing. Doesn't that just tell you the atmosphere we're living in now? Yeah, I think, Brandon, it's, it's a compelling case that these guys have some, uh, something to hide, that they are operating within the shadows. And then when they come forward with this stuff, and it comes out, then they start removing their, their, uh, the name of the church from the website. They start actually altering the audit. I'll point that out. Mm. Um, originally, number nine on the uh, Living Out audit said, church family members uh, instinctively share meals, homes, holidays, festivals, money, uh, children with others from different backgrounds and life situations from them. That's true or false. Now, uh, shortly after we exposed some of this um, audit's work with Dever and then also uh, Sam Albury speaking at the Living Out uh, or at the ERLC conference uh, in uh, Dallas, they changed number nine to read church family members instinctively share meals, homes, holidays, festivals, money, family life with others from different backgrounds. So they've taken out the word children. Uh, and so they know that 
people are getting sensitive to this. And uh, as I said, you know, MLK 50 really brought a lot of attention on them, that uh, unwanted attention. Sometimes you think these guys, uh, you know, uh, think they can't get enough attention because they're everywhere. But when the truth starts coming out, clearly, uh, and they are operating as change agents, they're working to bring about radical change within the church and to radically alter the church's views on social justice, on issues like race, on issues like LGBT. Clearly, we have something going on at the church, in the church that people have not been paying attention to in years past, but suddenly people are paying attention. This is a really good thing that people are noticing. They're picking up on it. And honestly, these guys have no right to make these decisions to move our families and our churches and even pervert the faith of our fathers uh, to make it uh, uh, acceptable and compliant with this whole agenda. Absolutely not. Uh, and, and again, let me just mention, if some of this is new to you or it's not, you want the documentation, a shameless plug again. I mean, this is in the book Marxianity that just came out in November 2018. It's 336 pages. Uh, it's uh, almost 400 footnotes. He mentioned the MLK 50 that was celebrating the life of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the 50th anniversary of his assassination. And I have a whole chapter in the book on Marxianity on the real worldview of Martin Luther King Jr., who was surrounded by communists. Uh, we can appreciate what he was trying to stand for when it came to civil rights movement, but he was going about it the wrong way, and his ultimate goal was not good. It was socialism. And uh, I document that by his own words in this book, Marxianity, along with everything we're talking about is in the book Marxianity. It's subtitled, How the Evangelical Deep State and Their Useful Idiots are Merging Marxism and Christianity Through Social Justice, White Privilege, Cultural Marxism, Illegal Immigration, Interfaith Dialogue, and more. And you can get a copy at... Uh, Marxianity.com. If you're saying, you know, I want more about what it is these guys are talking about, Marxianity.com, you can get the book there. Uh, what about your website? You're, they're going to find a lot of these articles on your website. What is your website? Uh, my website is 30piecesofsilver.org. It's just a small WordPress uh, uh, blog. And I don't blog every day because I don't think I have that much to say. And I'm not offering opinion. I'm just offering these research articles. And you can go to that, spell it out, 30piecesofsilver.org. And as Why you, did you call it that? Why is well, it called well, that? Well, obviously, because <laughs> uh, these guys are playing Judas, uh, and I think some of them are descended uh, directly, uh, in ap apostolic descent from, uh, mm. from Judas, who was willing to sell out the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And sadly, that's what we're seeing is a major sellout from some of the most trusted people within the evangelical community. And the church is not obligated to follow. You're not obligated to offer your children up, even your grown children, into church, these church plants or into these seminary classes where the stuff is being uh, engaged intentionally to deceive and to pervert the gospel. So uh, thankfully, there are people who are, are getting a hold of it. I'm, I'm getting a lot of contact from people uh, who are seeing it in their church, you know, and when, as you well know, you'll get these emails and calls and texts and stuff from people. And, you know, we make ourselves accessible so mm -hmm. we can answer people's mm -hmm. concerns. And honestly, I think we're, uh, the, 2018 was a turning point. They came much more out in the open. I don't think they can put the genie back in the bottle. They now. came out of the closet, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they did. <laughs> and so what we can do is take the opportunity to make sure that uh, this woke movement, as it's being called, mm. fails and people are awakened to the truth. And for those who maybe are, don't know what woke means, it's the idea that you've been awakened to your white privilege, your racism, your bigotry, your homophobia, your Islamophobia, you've been awoken or you've been woke. Mm -hmm. And this is a term that now the, uh, some of the guys within mainstream evangelicalism are, are promoting. Uh, Lincoln Duncan uh, wrote a, a, a foreword for a book called Woke that we did a whole review f on last uh, broadcast that you'll find at wvwtv.com. But whether it's Al Mohler, Lincoln Duncan, Mark Dever, these guys keep taking the stage, uh, if you will, at some of the most well-known Bible conferences with well-known Bible teachers, which again gives them theological cover, but is also just confusing the living daylights out of the sheep because they listen to what you and I are saying about Lingen Duncan, Mark Dever, and Moeller, among others, but those three alone. And then they see whose church platform they keep appearing on every year mm -hmm. at pastor's conferences, and they say, well, House and Littleton must be off their rocker because if these guys were really that bad, you know, these pastors that we come to love and respect and trust wouldn't be having them at their church conferences. What do you say to that? 
Well, I would say, you know, these guys in the past, maybe things, this, this might have been true of some of them. Uh, I, the, the bigger problem now is that, it, you know, it, we, we passed the point where the dividing line has been drawn. And so anyone who continues to be in association with what's being revealed at this point, uh, including the political agenda, which we saw manifest uh, during the midterms. Uh, clearly, people are willing to silence uh, whatever differences they may have, if indeed they do have any difference uh, and, and detraction from these guys' teachings, in order to remain in fellowship with them, to remain on the platform with them. And that's been one of the problems with the whole Gospel Coalition approach. It's kind of a preacher frat house. And people don't want to give up their their fraternal uh, you know bonds that they share within both the seminaries and in the Gospel Coalition itself, which sadly shows that the gospel is very secondary. So here we are looking at uh, not only, as I said, the uh, this push for the LGBT inclusion being a a clear indicator of how far we've come in this, but like I mentioned, the midterm elections. Uh, we saw more and more discussion of uh, what I think is uh, revealing discussions of the politics behind the Gospel Coalition. Um, Jonathan has All right, let me, um, let me go to a clip. I'm sorry, that was my phone, because I want to go to a clip now, the politics of it. Is this a good transition time yeah, for that? Yeah. This video that we're about to show, who, who is this? It's Mark Dever talking to a Jonathan Lehman, so I answered mm -hmm. that question, but, but who is Jonathan Lehman? He's the editor for Nine Marks, and these, these guys who are the editors are actually the guys who draft the message and keep the ma message on task. So as much uh, product as they're putting out and with all the different writers that are contributing, the editor is the main guy who's shaping and directing the message. So this is uh, uh, Jonathan Lehman, and they're discussing his book. Uh, I, I forget the name of it. At, at this point, because I, I don't want to plug it anyway, <laughs> but uh, he, he uh, they're interviewing and uh, talking to uh, about 400 pastors at the Southern Baptist Convention with a Nine Marks meeting, and Dever reveals something very interesting that's not in any of Lehman's bios. And what he's about to reveal is that his editor is a graduate of the London School of Economics, which uh, any of our regular listeners know, that is the Fabian Socialist School, the London School of Economics. And it was the Fabian Society that gave birth to the Labor Party that includes well-known politicians like Tony Blair, who has the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, who is openly trying to bring the religions of the world together as one. We know that the Fabian window designed by George Bernard Shaw in 1910 includes a wolf in sheep's clothing as the logo of the Fabian Socialist Society. Their goal is revolution by evolution. So this, it is not, a, a re, it is not um, a, just an outright revolution. It is socialism by evolution, not revolution. Let me say that again. It's socialism, the Fabian Society, the Fabian Socialist Society. They wanted socialism by evolution, not revolution, over time. Your Marxists want an outright revolution. The Marxists and the Fabians will work together in, in concert. One is more aggressive and just wants outright revolution. That's your Marxist. The Fabians want to mix socialism with capitalism, do it over time, and penetrate the churches, i.e. why the George Bernard Shaw Fabian window, celebrated by Tony Blair himself at its unveiling, because it was stolen, went missing, shows back up, and a big unveiling many years ago by Tony Blair as prime minister, talks about the Fabian window, how he hopes the Labor Party is carrying out the mission of the Fabian Society, and in the window is a wolf in sheep's clothing as their logo. So the editor, you're saying, Jonathan Lehman, for Mark Dever, Nine Marks has planted over 4,000 churches, influenced through the Gospel Coalition, Together for the Gospel, and on the platform of well-known Bible conferences. His editor, Dever admits, is a graduate of the London School of Economics. Yeah, it's pretty profound. And I think it's also profound that they had not revealed this in any of his biographical information. He's, he writes for the Gospel Coalition, the short bio there, says nothing about Lehman uh, carrying a, a master's in, in political philosophy uh, from London School of Economics. Uh, I looked at his bios everywhere. I haven't read his book yet, but he, uh, this is the only place that I've seen it revealed that he carries this uh, degree. And of course, uh, I think Dever couldn't help but brag about it, but he didn't realize in that moment what he revealed to those who are aware and uh, know what this means for Nine Marks. Let's go to that clip. Um, Jonathan has a master's in political philosophy from the London School of Economics. It's very dangerous for him to answer a question like that. We're gonna get bored very fast. 
So brother, you can do that so long as you remember it's after nine o'clock, after 10 o'clock from everybody coming from the East Coast. All right, so there you go. Uh, Mark Dever is admitting that his editor is a graduate of the London School of Economics. That's not something I would go around bragging about. No. No, not but, knowing the history and worldview of the Fabians. Would you go around bragging about that? No, but I'm I glad. mean, if you went there as a non-believer, excuse me for interrupting, but if you went yeah. there as a non-believer, let's say, and Dever just brought that up, it's kind of like, hey, the, his credentials are, he's from this great school, London. Yeah. Wouldn't you interrupt <laughs> him and say, wait a minute, that was when I wasn't a believer. I disavow the Fabian Social Society, the London School of Economics and their worldview. I disavow mm -hmm. that. You, wouldn't you do that? Yes, you would think. Uh, but and, he's bragging about it. Right. And, uh, and they make some fun with it because it, obviously he knows so much more than the audience oh, yes. that he could bore them yes. with his uh, long, exhaustive answers. But clearly he's gotten several um, you know, uh, theological degrees of the uh, neo-Calvinist uh, institutions so he can mask that and wrap and package that London School of Economics, Fabian Socialist ideology in their theology. That's a good... Uh, indicator of what we're seeing happen. In the same way with the, with the editor of the Gospel Coalition and the main uh, communications guy from the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission under Russell Moore is Joe Carter, same guy who's been trained at the Acton Institute with this same type of uh, social justice ideology and keeps the message for both the Gospel Coalition and the um, ERLC on track. And Acton Institute, again, it's all in the book, Marxianity, and you and I have done radio and TV mm -hmm. on it. Acton Institute is run by Robert Sirico, who was a Pentecostal pastor in the early 70s. And then, according to the news reports out west, and we have the screenshots, can, became an open homosexual, performed a homosexual marriage, and I guess is apparently a gay priest? Yes, he's now a Catholic priest. And, and he, he is, is the head of the Act Institute Yes, that Joe Carter of the Gospel Coalition works with. Yeah, that's his day job. And then he moonlights at the Gospel Coalition and the ERLC. So the point editors, being that we've got a broad problem. We've got an editor at the Gospel Coalition working at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission with Mark Dever and Russell Moore, Joe, Joe Carter, who works with the uh, reported gay priest Robert Sirico, who's into communitarianism, socialism mixed with capitalism, which again I explained in Marxianity. And then you got the editor over at Mark Dever's group, who's a graduate of the London School of Economics. So the point is, you got editors that are coming from organizations that we've been warning about for years when you talk about Fabian socialism or the alternative communitarianism. Because if you're a Fabian socialist, you belong to the Fabian Social Society. If you don't belong to the Fabian Socialist Society, we can't really call you a Fabian because you don't belong to the Fabian Social Society or gra haven't graduated from their school. But we could call you a communitarian, which is the same thing, the mixing of socialism with capitalism. So here you have Mark Dever's editor, is a graduate of the Fabian London School of Economics. Here you have Joe Carter, editor at the Gospel Coalition, who works with Mark Dever and Russell Moore at the Ethics Religious Liberty Commission. And he is working with the Act Institute, which is an organization that openly promotes communitarianism, mixing of socialism with capitalism. Now, these are the things we've been warning about for years and years. I mean, this is what my book, Religious Trojan Horse, The Coming Religious Reich, uh, Grave Influence. This is what these books have been warning about, this Fabian socialism with communitarianism. Now we're finding out here in 2018 that some of the biggest organizations within so-called mainstream evangelicalism that are planning churches, thousands of them, speaking at some of the biggest conferences like Together for the Gospel that just had 12,000 ministry leaders in April of 2018 in Kentucky, uh, the Gospel Coalition that influences no telling how many churches and thus millions of people in the pews, these very players are connected to the Fabian socialism and communitarianism model that we've been warning about that our critics wanted to say was conspiracy, but now they've just spilled their guts. Clearly, and, and their messaging. The message has changed. The message is migrating us and it's incrementalism. Well, now we see clearly who's shaping that message. So this is something Christians really have to, to take notice to. And you've got to wade through how they're shaping and warping the theology around this message because it's in fact perverting the gospel. One of the things that it really does in pushing this communitarianism and collectivism is they're detracting from individual Christianity. They're uh, detracting from individual salvation or the individual commitment or call 
uh, or the priesthood of the believer. And I'm a good Southern Baptist. I love the idea of um, you know, that we see biblically put forth in Revelation that we are all kings and priests to our God. So, you know, we don't have a, a written creed for Southern Baptists. And uh, that's one of the few things that I've really, really liked about it through the years. We're seeing that be lost in the name of pursuing the common good and this collective ideology. Tim Keller is very big on pushing this because you can't have a bunch of mavericks running around thinking for themselves. You need people thinking like sheep so they can be led down this uh, compliant path. Sadly, I would say that in the years I've been a Christian, I've never seen things on every front so deeply infiltrated. And the single biggest concern would be the impact these guys are having on our young men and women who are called into ministry. I was at the Southern Baptist Convention, as you know, carrying uh, Worldview Weekend credentials, and I was actually doing- As our, part of the press. Yes, part of the press. And I was uh, actually doing my broadcast when we were talking right across from the Nine Marks uh, uh, um, uh, booth there in the expo. And I noticed Dever was there. He was very popular. At any given time, he had 25, 30 young men just surrounding him like disciples at his feet. Of course, it's obvious that he could help you get a church plant. He could help you get a job, you know, and uh, get and help you launch your ministry. And hey, if you're a really innovative guy, you could be the next big thing once you tie into these guys. And, and sadly, you know, the ambitions and just the need for employment the frustration that a lot of these young guys uh, have had trying to find positions of ministry or staff positions. Or Meaning pastors. they spend a lot of money and time getting a degree and then they can't find a job. They can't find a job. So these planting arms uh, actually have made it easy because they have a lot of money from outside the church. Guys like Bob Buford who have poured money into uh, essentially creating this new paradigm uh, church within evangelicalism by spreading the franchise. And, and I Bob Buford, again, for those who maybe is new, he died this year. He died this year. He, was, he founded Leadership Network. He brought the Drucker, Peter Drucker ideology into the church. Which was and, the three-legged stool, government, corporations, mm -hmm. and church. If you merge government, corporations, and the church, working together, it's a three-legged stool, we can defeat the global giants. This is Rick Warren's model, Peter Drucker, Drucker Bob Buford. Um, they really helped to launch the Emergent Church. Yep. Again, all of this is in the book, Marxianity. The Emergent Church was launched by, mm -hmm. by Peter Drucker and Bob Buford. He, they influenced also Rick Warren, Tim Keller. They also influenced um, uh, uh, Ed Stetzer. Ed Stetzer. So, I mean, that, and you're talking Lifeway Research. And, uh, which uh, Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels, yes. This is, what, this is when you really started seeing traditional churches going from traditional, transitional, and then completely transformed and you're like, what just happened to the church of multiple yeah. generations of my family? Yeah, if you've been like me a, a couple of times in the last uh, 15 years where you were displaced from your church because this stuff was taking over and you're in the thankless task of looking for a new church home, you walk in and you almost know as soon as the music starts, you know, the lights go down and, and the smoke machines come on. I, I've been told we're spending more money on smoke machines than Bibles today mm. in the church. But sadly, you hear the messaging, you know that you're in one of these, uh, one of these various models that they're uh, marketing throughout the church. And you clearly get the idea that this stuff is very packaged, and that's because it is. It's, it's just like buying a burger franchise or a taco franchise, and everything is packaged. You have these editors like Lehman and Carter who are helping shape right down to the very sermons within. Uh, one of the church planting arms that Buford has helped is the Association of Related Churches, very active in Alabama, has a large, large church, Church of the Highlands, all operating on this model it's independent, so there's really not much of a, a theological framework uh, or obligation for it. But uh, they planted over a hundred churches in one year for the Association of Related Churches with outside funding from and, billionaires. And, and, and the outside funding is a key, and we can get this into this in another program. But a lot of this outside funding is liberal, liberal foundations. Right. And if you will push their narrative, their worldview, their philosophy, their ideas, they'll give you money. But we're talking about globalist, mm -hmm. liberal, globalist foundations helping to plant so-called evangelical churches, correct? Right, right. All right, let's go to another clip before we run out of time. And that is, again, Mark Dever with mm -hmm. Jonathan Lehman. What are we about to see? Well, they start talking politics here near the end of this uh, hour, and they are talking about uh, the problem of being a single issue voter. Uh, Dever is not as willing to say what that single issue is, but of course we know it's pro-life, uh, pro-life uh, pro versus pro-abortion. 
And so they're pushing back saying that Christians are being divisive by being pro-life and we're not allowing space for people to be uh, supporting candidates who are pro-choice. So it's a very interesting conversation, but one that is, uh, uh, is as disturbing as anything I've heard a Southern Baptist uh, say in relation to politics in a long time. Let's go to that clip. Well, just I don't have much time left to make people mad. So uh, <laughs> what about one issue voting? I think one of the things that most separates white and black Christians in America is one issue voting. I think white Christians think this is the only moral way to approach voting. I think they've never thought of any other thing, generally. I think a lot of our African-American brothers and sisters realized like a long time ago that, well, there are going to be a bunch of different issues that are going to be affecting us. And I can vote for a candidate who I disagree with about some very important issues that I don't really think they're going to get anything done on. But I agree with them on these other issues that I think are going to help a lot of people. Can, even if you don't adopt that thought yourself, can you allow space for that in your church as a morally legitimate argument and option? So I can understand, for instance, how a person might, I might not agree with it, but I can understand how a person might decide, well, <clears throat> look, uh, I'm, I'm pro-life, but... Um, you know, there have been Republican pro-life quote-unquote candidates in the White House for the last number of, of decades, and yet the laws haven't been overturned. Meanwhile, I think this, let's just say, I'm thinking hypothetically, the welfare policies of these candidates has actually decreased the number of real abortions in such and such a state and actually brought the number of abortions down. So though they are pro-choice, I think that they've actually helped the abortion issues as opposed to your Republican candidate. Now, I might not personally agree with that argument. I might say, well, that's wrong for reasons X, Y, and Z. Nonetheless, I can understand how a Christian in good conscience could make that argument. And therefore, I'm going to leave space for that particular option for Christians. Unlike, now it's possible we can get to an issue, I'm going to vote for a pro-Nazi candidate, a Ku Klux Klan candidate, a Communist Party candidate in China. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restrict a bit more. It's, it, there are parties, there are candidates that I think are beyond the pale. And it's possible we reach a place in American history where we, we decide that's the case for certain parties, and I think some Christians already feel that way. Nonetheless, I would say I think we're still in a two-party system where Christians can, in good conscience, make different kinds of arguments, and we need to leave space for that last comment. Insofar as we don't, we risk, and I think we all know this, subverting Christianity and the gospel to party identity. And how's that going for us? Not very good, I don't think. So, brother pastor of all people, you must learn how to communicate with people who disagree with you on secondary and tertiary matters. And part of that is being deciding what those issues are you have to agree on and what you can disagree about. And that is where having a plurality of elders will help your local church. <laughs> Do that. And that plurality of elders will help you be discerning about what issues you should or should not allow liberty in. All right, Tom, I think in our next broadcast, we need to pick it up right here and go through what these guys said because it's very, very troubling what they just said. Uh, first of all, I kind of find it a little racist. Blacks automatically are going to vote for the liberal socialist, mm -hmm. social justice people. Uh, then he wants to talk about minority votes one way, non-minorities vote another way. Again, that seems a little racist in its fit on itself. He wants to give an example. I would say, give me one example where social justice welfare programs have reduced abortions. He talks about that. I don't know of any such example. It doesn't exist that I know of. He talks about, well, if we get people who are pro-Nazis, then we got to take a stand. Well, th does he not know that Margaret Sanger worked <laughs> with a Nazi doctor to promote abortion? And then... Dever wants to say that you have to have a plurality of elders to tell you how to vote, a plurality of elders to help you decide what are secondary issues and what are not secondary issues. All of this is worthy of a whole program, or at least a big chunk of a program, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. All right, let's pick it back up when we come back, folks. Uh, flat out of time, I guess, is Tom Littleton. He'll be back for the next broadcast. What's your website again? 30piecesofsilver.org.
30piecesofsilver.org. Very troubling issues, but very important issues. And I hope you appreciate what we're doing. If you do, don't forget about our um, foundation. Make a tax-deductible contribution, if you would, at wvwfoundation.com. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the year. The majority of our, uh, well, about 40%, I should say, of our annual budget comes in the last six weeks of the year. So please consider making a tax-deductible contribution now at wvwfoundation.com. You can also send a check or use the phone number on the screen. Again, our website, wvwfoundation.com. Thank you so much for helping us continue this broadcast ministry. Well, until next time, I'm Brandon House. Thanks for watching. Take care.